you very much. He's the author of a string of worldwide bestsellers on speed, productivity, growth, and innovative leadership. He's a passionate catalyst for change who delivers solid takeaways. I promise you. What changes as a result of the new mission statement? Say it. What do you need to let go of? He prepares himself to thrill and involve the audience. I'm the guy that takes the time to interview about 10 or 12 people who are going to be attending the speech. USA Today calls him one of the most in-demand speakers in the world. And he brings audiences to their feet. When Jason said to me, one of the things I want to do before Partner Summit, in fact, he said that I require to do before Partner Summit, is to inter interview a set of partners from around the world so that I can make sure that I understand what the partners in the room are thinking about, what's top of mind for them. And I just was really impressed for, by that. His Wall Street Journal and New York Times bestsellers include, it's not the big that eat the small, but the fast that eat the slow and hit the ground running. Jason and his teams have studied more than 120,000 companies around the world that have successfully reinvented and transformed themselves. Please welcome to the stage, Jason Jennings. Good afternoon. Oh, come on, if you knew what I'd been through in the last couple of weeks, you'd give me a better good afternoon than that. Let's try it one more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I was invited to sit up here next to Keith and the other executives, and I said, you know, I, I can't sit up there before I go on because I'm so nervous before a speech. I just need to stand in the back and walk it off and shake hands and stuff. And nobody believes that I'm nervous before a speech, but I get so nervous before a speech, and I'm curious. If you had to get up here for an hour, how many of you would agree to having some nervousness about standing up here for an hour and speaking? Raise your hands. Some studies have shown that people are more afraid of public speaking than they are of death. I won't go that far, but people always say, what do you get nervous about? And I thought I'd begin my remarks this afternoon with that story. Let me tell you what makes me nervous. I have never missed a speech in my life. I have driven through snowstorms all night long. I've spoken with, uh, spoken with a broken leg, double pneumonia. My worry, uh, I'm, I will always show up. My worry is that I'll show up to speak, but that nobody will show up to listen to me speak. And you may say, well, what a stupid, unfounded fear, unless it's happened to you once. And here's the story. I was invited to go to India and give the opening keynote address at a conference entitled Advertising and Developing Third World Nations being put on by an American promoter. So I flew to New Delhi, my first trip there, checked into the Taj Mahal Hotel, had a couple of great days in New Delhi and Old Delhi, and the conference is supposed to start on a Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. So by 7 o'clock, I'm dressed, I'm downstairs, I want to shake hands. There's beautiful ladies at long tables and saris with 400 name badges. Not one person shows up. It turns out it was the final day of the cricket test between India and Pakistan. Uh, that, for the uninitiated, is like the Super Bowl times 100. In fact, it's so big that India and Pakistan had declared a truce in their war in, over Kashmir to finish this damn cricket game. So I figured, there's no speech today. Well, at about two minutes before nine, the big American promoter bellies up to me and he says, are you ready for your speech? And I said, duh, there's nobody here. And he said, have you been paid? And I said, yes. He said, well, dance for daddy. And I said, you do not expect me to get up and give a speech to an empty room. And he said, I certainly would. He said, except one person showed up, and the show must go on. So with 399 empty seats, and one guy sitting in the back of the room, he gets up, Keith, and does an introduction that's every bit as, as poetic as yours. I'm going, dear God, please let some more people show up. Nobody else ever showed up. It's the longest 90, it was a 90-minute speech, longest 90 minutes of my life. At the end of 90 minutes, I look around the room, and I said, I want to thank uh, you <laughs> for having been here, and I wish you a great conference. The guy starts to applaud. I start walking out. The guy walks up to me and says, would you stick around for a while? I'm the next speaker.
I have a problem with some other authors and speakers. I've seen some of them miss the boat because they have failed to do some basic homework. I don't think it's the speaker's job to get up and talk about what they want to talk about. I believe it's the speaker's job to get up and talk to people about what's on their mind. And so over the past uh, couple of weeks, I've had the opportunity to reach out to a whole bunch of real people. You'll see them behind me right now. These are people who are out in the audience all around the world, the Cisco partners, and I've asked them three questions. And for those of you I spoke with, you'll remember the questions. Number one, tell me the story of your company. Kim, you'll remember that conversation. Number two, tell me your story. Where are you from? Where did you go to school? And how did you get to where you are right now? And then finally, what are the things that are keeping you awake at night these days? Or asked another way, what are the potential stumbling blocks that could get in the way of your organization achieving its full economic potential? I want to show you what you told me. Number one, it came up in every conversation. They said, Jason, one of the things you have to understand that we deal with in this business is non-stop change. It comes at us faster than the speed of light. So if there's something that I lose sleep over, that's one of the things. But everybody else talked about the fact of how do we need to grow because an organization is of no value if it's not growing, and how do we get everybody on board for growth? The next thing that everybody talked about was how do we make sure in this rapidly changing environment that we remain relevant and we don't get commoditized out of business. But during every single conversation, the number one topic that came up, every discussion was how do we find, keep, and grow the right people so that we can master the art of doing all these other things. So today what I'm going to share with you are the five, the five rules from the world's best for owning the game. Rule number three, and this is going to fly in the face of everything you've ever been taught about business, I promise you. Companies that grow, embrace change, remain relevant and find, keep and grow the right people make certain that everyone in the organization knows the strategy. Let me set this up with very two quick anecdotes. About a year ago, I was hired to do a morning keynote address for a big health insurance company. Uh, it was going to be held in Chicago. I'm not going to mention the health insurance company, but it was Aetna. <laughs> and uh, I'd been on the phone with Ron Williams, their president, a number of times, because he wanted to know what I was going to talk about, and he and I became friends. And I wanted to know what he was going to say in his introduction. So the deal was this. He was introducing me for 10 or 15 minutes, and then I was speaking. And so I show up two hours in advance. I'm dressed. I'm shaking the hands, working the crowd. Finally, at two minutes before nine, gong, 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 and everybody's moving into the ballroom, and I start going into the ballroom, and this young woman comes up and grabs my arm, and she says, where are you going? And I said, oh, I'm Jason Jennings. I'm, uh, I'm your guest speaker. I'm going to be on. She said, I know who you are. She said, but where are you going? I said, well, I'm, I give, I'm giving the speech in there. She said, uh, you're not allowed in there. And I said, excuse me? She said, I'll come and get you in 10 minutes. I said, well, why aren't I not allowed in there? She said, well, because Ron Williams, our CEO, is doing the introduction. I said, I know. He and I have been talking about it. Uh, she said, but you're not allowed in there. And I said, what are you talking about? He knows what I'm going to say. I know what he's going to say. We're both singing off the same page of the hymnal. She said, you're not allowed in there. I said, why is that? She said, because during his speech, he might accidentally mention something about our strategy. And unless you've signed a non-disclosure agreement, you're not allowed to know it. So I stood out there cooling my heels for 10 or 15 minutes, and they came and got me and wound me up and put me on stage. Contrast that with this. Here I am back on Strawberry Lane in Oroville, Ohio, with Tim and Richard Smucker, and midway through our all-day meeting, they shove a 20-page booklet across the desk at me. And I said, what's that? And they said, well, take a look at the cover. And the cover says, the J.M. Smucker Strategy. And I said, oh my God, this is cool. I said, do you think I could borrow this while I'm writing the book? I'd be happy to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And they looked at me and they said, what kind of jerks do you normally hang around with? <laughs> they said, Jason, when somebody comes to work for us, they have to go to school for two weeks to make certain they know our strategy. We don't want anybody to work for us who doesn't know our strategy. Before we bring on a new vendor or supplier, 
they have to know our strategy of what value could a vendor or supplier be if they don't know our strategy. And they said, for God's sake, Jason, before somebody buys a share of our stock, we hope they'll take the time to know our strategy. But you see, in most organizations, man, that strategy is top secret stuff. It's only on a need to know basis by the most important people in the organization. Well, here's why it doesn't work. Secret strategy doesn't work for the following reasons. Number one, when people don't know why they're doing what they're doing, there's no way to get emotionally connected to their job. Is it any surprise that 72% of American workers say that they have no emotional attachment to their work? They don't know why they're doing what they're doing. They don't know their role in the big picture. Secret strategies don't work because corners get cut and illegal things can happen. Think about that. A group of greedy bankers on Wall Street in New York almost brought the world economy to a stop. You think there were some secret strategies involved there? Well, no, make sure you don't tell anybody else about this. This is just between us, strictly on a need-to-know basis, us smart people. And the final reason that secret strategies don't work is this. When the strategy is secret, there's zero accountability. Because when a leader announces a strategy, and everybody knows it, and it doesn't work, maybe it's time for a new leader. Remember the things that you told me? Finding, keeping, and growing the right people, dealing with nonstop change, getting everybody on board for growth, making certain the organization remains relevant. Imagine what happens when you as the leader get everybody in the organization to share the same big noble purpose, work relentlessly to let go, to know the strategy and their role in the achievement, to think and act like owners, and to be good stewards. In closing, let me say this. I have enjoyed being with you today more than you can possibly imagine. I hope our paths cross again. You might have gathered two things, or you might have gathered one thing, but there's a second maybe you didn't. The one thing that you probably gathered is this. I am a passion-filled teacher. I love to teach. And I'm a richer man for having been allowed to be here today and be a teacher. But the thing maybe you started figuring out, or maybe you have, is my cause. And my cause is this. I know that if each of us awoke every morning and looked in the mirror and said, today, I'm going to be a good steward in everything I do, and I'm going to let being a good steward guide my every decision, here's what I know. I know every business organization would be better. I know every municipality would be better. I know every state would be better, every nation would be better, and the world would be a much better place. And so in clothing, in closing, I'm going to ask you to do one favor for me, and that is this. If the idea of being a good steward is appealing to you, I'm going to ask you to stand up where you are right now. And I'm going to ask you to take the pledge for making the world a better world. There's nothing religious about the pledge. But the pledge is this. I ask you to join me in just saying the words, I will be a good steward in all I do. Will you join me? I will be a good steward in all I do. Thank you all. It was wonderful being with you.